of the rooster outside his bedroom window. He looked up at the thatched roof of the cottage and stretched. Then he turned and he put his feet down on the smooth wooden floor and stood up and he pulled on his stockings that went up to his knee and his knee-length breeches and his white shirt and he picked up the jacket that he would have to wear when he went to school that day and he slid his feet into two brown leather shoes. He walked to the corner of his room and looked out. It was a winter morning, so there was still a lot of darkness. The sun hadn't really begun to shine yet there at the top of the hill on the wilderness. He could see from his window that... Then he heard his mother calling. She was downstairs already making breakfast. So he hurried downstairs and he put his jacket down. And then she said, go, go town, feed the chickens quickly. We don't want to keep your father waiting for breakfast. He ran outside to feed the chickens. He, he put out the feed for those chickens. And as he stood there, the, the sun started to rise over the hill. He turned and he looked at a mound that he had dug himself with his own hands just a year before when his pet crow had died. He had written an epitaph for the crow. It said he still remembered the words because he was certain that no other boy in his class could have written such a fine poem of an epitaph. It said, here lies the body of John Crow, who once was high, but now is. <laughs> you brother birds, take heed all, for as you rise, so must you fall. He was pretty impressed by his own efforts. And he walked back inside and he saw that his father was already seated at the table. And there were three bowls of porridge. He sat down and he began to eat quickly as his father, who was an artisan in the town, as he began to talk with his mother about the coming day. When Thomas was finished with his food, he got up, he put on that jacket, and he walked down from the wilderness onto Bridge Road to the Thetford Grammar School. And he went into his classes and he noticed, as he always noticed, that his shoes weren't quite as fancy as most of the other boys. His parents could hardly afford to send him to the school, so they certainly couldn't afford the brass buckles that many of the other students wore. But he was one of the best students. There was nothing else that separated him from the other students except for the fact that his father would not let him learn Latin. His father was determined that Thomas would be just the same as he was. An artisan, that's the way things went. You did what your father did. Well, Thomas looked around and he saw the other boys preparing their Latin and he was determined that he would pick up as much as he could by listening. The lessons for the day started and before long the schoolmaster, he started to tell a story. He opened his mouth and said, it was a hard, hard time for the children of Israel. They had come into the promised land, and they expected there to be plenty of good things. But it had been problem after problem after problem for them. And, well, now the Midianites had come, and they had taken away every year for seven years all their crops and all their animals, and the people were hungry, and they were suffering, and they were crying out, saying, Lord God, why are you not helping us? Well, Gideon was one of those people who was afraid. And he had gathered up all of the barley crop that he could hide from the Midianites, and he had taken it down, not to the top of a hill, to thresh it like normally he would have, but he took it down into a wine press. And he was working hard, throwing that grain up and letting it fall, and then having to separate out the pieces of the grain and the outside of the grain. And he suddenly got a feeling 
a feeling that many of us have gotten before. I'm sure, man, that you have had that feeling. Somebody just looks at you. Don't know why they're looking at you. And he looked up. He saw a man sitting under the nearby ancient oak tree. That man didn't look like a Midianite. He wasn't as big or dressed like a Midianite. But he didn't look like an Israelite either. And so he looked up at this man and the man said, Hello, Gideon. Gideon was quite sure he had never met this man before. And he was even more sure he had never introduced himself. So he looked up at the man and said, Who are you? And the man said, I am the Lord your God. Come to call you to help save your people. Gideon felt a little skeptical. <laughs> he wasn't quite used to this sort of thing, so he told the man, hold on just a minute. And he ran back to his house, and he got a big piece of goat meat. And he got a bowl of broth, and he got a flat piece of unleavened bread, and he put them in a basket. He ran back, and he put them on a stone in front of the man, and then he poured the broth on top of the meat and on top of the bread, and he looked at the man and said, if you are who you say you are, make that wet, sopping offering burn. And the man took his staff and he put it down on top of that big rock and it, the offering didn't just burn, it was consumed instantly. And Gideon decided this was probably who he said he was. <laughs> but he still wasn't quite sure about this whole thing. He said, well, what do you want me to do? And he said, I want you to gather an army to save your people. You know, I just need another little test. I, I, I'm gonna put out a fleece tonight. A fleece in the middle of the wine press. And, and if that fleece in the morning is wet, so wet that I can bring out a bowl full of water and the rest around it is dry, then, then I will know that you are sending me to do what you said. And so that night he put out the, he put out that fleece and then he went back to bed. And he tossed and he turned and he turned and he tossed. And when the light started to rise up, he turned and he ran out that door right to that wine press. And he, he felt that the ground was dry and he felt that the fleece was wet and he wrung out that fleece into a bowl and it filled the bowl with water and then, then he had a thought. That could have happened on its own. So he turned and looked and saw the Lord God standing there and he said, you know, this was a really nice confirmation, but I'd like for you to do it the opposite way. I'd like for the ground to be wet and the fleece to be dry and then I will know for sure that this is what you want me to do. And so that night he put out the same fleece that was still a little damp. And he went back to his house and he lay down and he tossed and he turned and he turned and he tossed and the first light was rising outside his window and he ran outside and he ran and he almost slipped and fell. The water was all over the floor of the wine press but in the center that fleece was dry. So he turned and said, I believe you want me to do what you say you want me to do. And so Gideon called for men from all around to come join an army to defeat the Midianites. And the men came, they started to come with a trickle and then with a flood. And before long, there were 22,000 men. And Gideon was starting to feel all right about this. He thought that maybe they could beat the Midianites. And then he felt a tap on his shoulder. And he turned, and there was the man again. And he said, Gideon, there are too many men here in this army. And Gideon said, have you seen? Have you seen the numbers of the Midianites? There are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of them. This is not too many. But what would you have me do? And so he gathered together all those 22,000 men. 
and he told them, if you're afraid, you can leave. You can go back to your homes. And he watched to see who would go. At first it was just a trickle. But then it became a roaring flood of 12,000 men who left, which left him with only 10,000 men. So he tried to encourage himself. He said, 10,000 isn't so bad. 10,000, we might be able to win with 10,000 after all. If we have a miracle on our side, and if the Lord God has told me to do this, there must be a miracle coming. So, And it was then that he felt a tap on his shoulder. And he turned around, and the Lord God said, there are still too many men. Nobody will believe that it was me who did this instead of you. And Gideon said, have you seen the Midianites? They're so they could have might as well be giants, and that's just the women. The men are even bigger. And the children, they start to learn to fight from the time they're toddlers. Surely. What do you want me to do? And so Gideon brought all those 10,000 men down to the river. And he watched as 9,700 of those men laid down on their bellies and drank from the river. And only 300 picked up the water and drank from their hands. So he sent home those 9,700 men like he had been told to do. And he looked at the 300 that were left. And he wasn't feeling too good about that when he felt another tap on the shoulder. And he turned around, he was expecting something else terrible, and at that moment, he heard, you might need some encouragement. <laughs> Go down to the Midianite camp, and you will hear words that will strengthen your heart. And so, he went down with his servant into the camp, and he was just on the edge of the camp when he heard a big, booming voice, and he looked through the cracks and saw a big Midianite man saying, oh, I just had the worst dream. I dreamed that there was, there was a huge loaf of barley bread that came rolling down the hill and crashed into my tent and made it fall over. And his friend looked at him and said, you, you have been dreaming about Gideon. Gideon is the man who has been given the task of destroying the Midianite army, and he will do it. And Gideon, Gideon felt like that was a pretty good sign. So he went back to his 300 men and gave them all trumpets, and then he gave them all different containers, pottery containers, and put a torch inside of each one. And he divided the men up into three groups, and he prepared them for the signal, and when he gave the signal, the doo -doo -doo -doo, then those men rushed down into the Midianite camp, and they blew the trumpets, and they crashed their pottery, and then they held up the lights, and the Midianites were convinced that thousands of men were coming to defeat them, and they ran, and the Israelites were saved, and they were excited, they were thrilled, and they came to Gideon, and they said, you, you are such a good ruler. You're such a good savior. You need to be our king and your sons after you. And Gideon said, that is a really bad idea. Just because I was able to do this doesn't mean my son should be treated after me. I will be your judge, your ruler for my lifetime. And then you can choose other rulers after that. And that was the way it Gideon ruled to the end of his life, and then other judges rose up to rule over Israel. And at the end of the story, young Tom was thinking of it in his mind when it was time to go outside and, and eat the apples and the nuts that their mothers had packed them. And he was thinking when the boys began to share about, about a new song that they had just learned about God save great George our King, God save the noble King. And the rest of the day during his lessons, he kept thinking about that song and that story. And he went back 
to his mother that night and he told her the story and the song that he had learned. And his mother saw that he was thinking deeply about these things. And as often happens, young Thomas came here to be a man and he found himself on the other side of the ocean in a place called Philadelphia. And he wrote a book called Common Sense. And he told the story of Gideon. Gideon who had won a great victory, but who refused to be king and his sons after them because he thought things should work differently. And before long, that book, it made a difference all up and down the 13 colonies of what would one day become the United States of America. And that book made it across the ocean, back to Thetford, to a little cottage where his mother still lived. And she read that book. And each year on July 4th, she would fast all day in honor of her son, a son of Thetford who grew up to help free his people, the people who were the citizens of the world.